So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we look to you as the God of all understanding and wisdom. Uh, we ask that you would illuminate our hearts with your word by your Holy Spirit of your truth. Open your word of truth. Uh, give us uh, conviction, give us understanding, and give us hope and encouragement. Uh, build us up as individually and as a body. So we put our trust in you and we give you all the thanks for everything that you will do and do do. So trust in you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So uh, it was said of the church at one time that the church turned the whole world upside down. <laughs> These guys are really upset with the apostles and their preaching and all the large people crowds of people turning to them for salvation, the church growing a lot. They didn't like it. And that was then. That was 2,000 or so years ago. How about in 2022? Maybe in our day that we live in, maybe the world has turned the, the church upside down. The world has infiltrated the church and a lot of church people and even pastors are thinking and acting the way the world does and the way the world wants us to. Uh, there's a man named Barna, and he does surveys. He's done it for a number of years. He surveys uh, Christians and Christian pastors. And in 2004, he found that only one half of Christian pastors have a biblical worldview. You know, worldview is everything that we view about life. Uh, what do we view about the family? Um, about the, the value of a person, the value of a human life? What do we view about sin, about s salvation, and about a relationship to God, and about uh, human character and human nature, about creation, about sexual relationships? Everything that we view about God, do we view it according to what the Bible says or according to what the world says? Well, in 2004, one half of the Christian pastors, one half, didn't have an adequate biblical worldview? How about in 2022? He took another survey recently. So it went from about 50% of the pastors having a biblical worldview down to 37% of the pastors of Bible teaching churches have a, a biblical worldview in America. Now, 62% of them are synchristic. <laughs> they like to blend things together so it's not only the Bible. That's why they don't have a thoroughly biblical worldview. They take the Bible and, and they blend it with other religions or whatever the world is teaching. And that, that is what is happening. So 37% of the pastors, associate pastors, how about them? Well, they're down to 28% have a Christian worldview. And you want to know why our youth are so messed up today? Beyond the schools that they go to and are taught Marxism and sexual immorality and lies about history. 13% of children or youth ministers have a biblical worldview. 13%. No wonder they're so confused, messed up, and they don't know God's way of thinking. They don't know God's ways. They don't have a worldview according to the Bible. And having a, a worldly worldview, that also goes along with speech. How we talk. What do we say to one another? Uh, the world today is very vulgar. I have uh, movies that I would enjoy watching except for the language. Uh, the, the swearing just is just too much. I worked in places where everybody swore, and so most of my life I worked in places where people swore. Um, but I don't want to be exposed to it all the time. Um, the way that people talk. People backstab. They talk behind people's back, and they, they make false statements. They slander people. Uh, one person is jealous of another person, so he'll run that person down in front of everybody so 
He can look more important than that other person. People gossip. They spread lies that aren't true. Um, the Bible does have some things to say about hearing both sides of a story. And it says in Proverbs something like, um, well, when you hear one side of the story, you think, oh, wow, that, that's it, you know, until you hear the other side. And you go, oh, okay, well, I'm glad I hear the other side. A lot of times in biblical circles, it's just like the world. You hear a gossip about somebody and you just buy it as truth not investigating to see if maybe it's not true. But we shouldn't be talking about people anyway. The world does it. Worthless speech. We looked about that last week, having speech that's um, worthless as a rotten fish or a piece of rotten fruit. It's good for nothing, and it's also rotten. Uh, people speak out in anger and take revenge and have hatred. That is... In the church, more than I'd like to see, the more than we know, it, it's so sad. So many angry people that never let go of their anger, the bitterness just sees month after month, year after year towards other believers. Uh, people have wrath towards one another. I've, I've watched videos of churches having fistfights and the police having to be called over uh, who is going to be pastor and who knows whatever else. Uh, this is the day and age where we repay evil for evil. If someone does evil to us, we want to repay them back. That's the way the world does. But a Christian worldview wouldn't do that. A Christian worldview returns good for evil. If someone is evil to us, we do good back to them. If someone who is our enemy and does wrong to us if they're hungry, we don't laugh at them and ridicule them because they're hungry. No, we give them bread. If they're thirsty, we give them water, preferably cold water. Much different than the world. Uh, this is the day and age of payback. <laughs> All of the memes that are so funny on our phones, memes about everything, and we look at these things, but a lot of times, you know, they're ridiculing, they're slanderous, they're evil. Uh, saying such bad things about our enemies. That really isn't God's way. Uh, the church has become known as somebody that shoots its own wounded. And that's not good. Now, we have different denominations uh, and sometimes some people of one denomination don't want to fellowship with another denomination because they just don't go along with what they say. But the world has infiltrated the church quite a bit. And in today's scripture, we're going to see how God reacts to that when the people in the church act like the world. Um, remember in the beginning of chapter 4, it says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling you have received. We've been called to be, be the children of God. We've been called to be holy and righteous. And then over in verse 17, we're told to, uh, we must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the fertility of their mind. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God by their ignorance and their callous and they're sensual and they're greedy and they're impure. And that's not the way you learn Christ. <laughs> We're supposed to have a different worldview when we get saved. And uh, it's something that uh, God really, really wants us to be like believers, like loving Christians that love one another and forgive one another and care for one another. So uh, today in this lesson, we can read this verse in verse 30, Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And so we want to look at speech because this verse is tied to the verse right before it. The verse before it says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. There's a command. Don't let that corrupting talk come out. But only such as is good for building up, 
as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, because if you're letting the corrupt talk come out, you are grieving the Holy Spirit of God. So we want to look at this verse uh, from three different areas. What grieves the Spirit of God? What is the Holy Spirit of God? Who is the Holy Spirit of God? And what is the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God? What does he do? Well, first of all, what grieves the Holy Spirit of God? What does this word grieve mean? Uh, it's an emotion that the Holy Spirit has. Holy Spirit is God. God has a lot of emotions. He has joy, and he has love, and he has anger and wrath, and, and he can be grieved. Uh, there's so much more that can be said about that. But uh, grieving means to feel pain or sorrow, to be sad, to be very distressed. And isn't that something that the God of the universe I can talk about people down here on this earth and that just breaks his heart. That grieves him. It makes him sorrowful. It makes him sad when I act like that. Um, in scripture, some places where this word grieve is used, we can get an idea of how intense it is when we picture Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he was uh, betrayed and arrested and then mistreated and put to death. When he was in the garden, he was praying to God and his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death, the heavy burden of grief on his heart. And then in Mark 3, 5, he was uh, going to heal a man on the Sabbath and the religious leaders were all upset about that and he did heal that man. <laughs> and he looked on these religious leaders with anger and it, he was grieved he was just saddened by the hardness of their hearts they would not understand God's ways they, they were so intent on having their own works religion it grieved him and then John sixteen six, when the disciples heard that he was going to be leaving oh Jesus is going to be gone their hearts were grieved they were full of sorrow they were sad, intensely so. And then uh, a very intense passage in Romans chapter 9, verse 2, was the Apostle Paul who was uh, a missionary called to the Gentiles. But he had a great love for his own people, the Jews. And he said that he has great sorrow in his heart because Israel is lost. He even had such great sorrow that he said if it were possible, if he could go to hell and have all the Jews saved, he would do it. He would spend eternity in hell if the Jews could be saved. And he said, I have such sorrow for them because they're rejecting their Messiah. So this word grief is a very intense word, a very emotional, very deep word. And what uh, causes God to grieve God is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. So in this context, the very first word in, in verse 30 is the word and. So that connects it with this verse right in front of it. Let no corrupting speech. It also can be taken back to verse 25, which all involves the way Christians talk to one another. He says, don't lie to one another because we're all neighbors, right? We're all members of one another. And then in verse 26, he, he says, be angry, but don't sin. When a Christian is angry with another believer for a just reason, he can be angry, but don't turn it into sin. Because if you start uh, hating the person, or if it goes on day after day after day or week after week, then that anger can be used by the devil to cause uh, divisions to cause uh, schisms in a church, to break up a church, to break up some kind of a body or ministry. And so uh, we're not to sin when we're angry. 
We're not to steal from one another or we're not to talk trash to each other or gossip or talk behind other believers' backs. We're only supposed to build up one another. So it grieves the Holy Spirit when he sees believers actually giving the devil an opportunity to do his dirty work. It's really quite tragic to see that. Christians use to um, cause trouble in a Christian organization or a church, even in a believer's life. So when God hears about how we talk to each other sometimes or how we talk about each other, he's very grieved over it. Our speech is, is so so powerful. We could take a moment to look at James chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, where he's talking about how powerful the tongue is in a Christian speech. Uh, we've heard people say, um, well, that's just the alcohol in him talking, or just the drugs in him talking, or, huh. well, really, it takes the inhibitions away, so that's really what's in the person's heart when he starts talking badly. But looking at James chapter 3, uh, verse 6, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. I guess every forest fire starts small, <laughs> campfire, discarded cigarette, whatever. But then the thing turns into a huge inferno. And somebody talking just by a few little words all of a sudden can turn into a nightmare. And the tongue is a fire. It's a world of unrighteousness. All of this would grieve the Holy Spirit. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. I guess that's where you have the uh, devil using another believer's mouth to bring destruction. For every uh, kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. I guess we've all been to places like Marine World or whatever and seen them tame the animals, little birds all the way to the giant whales. But no human being can tame the tongue and what we say. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. And uh, at times in my life, I've, I've spoken words I wish I could retrieve. But once they're out there in somebody else's word, ears, it's very hard. Um, hearing some of the evil things that all kids going to school around the world say about each other. Full of deadly poison. And, and kids grow up their whole life remembering these evil things that were said by them. And for believers, we bless our Lord and Father. We're at church and, you know, we pray and sing praises to God. And, but then we go home and we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. That's something the world is missing. Kids are taught in school that we're nothing more than mere uh, animals. We're the highest of the animals. And the animals are even more important than human beings. Where God's worldview is entirely different. God says man is made in the image of God. Therefore, every person, every living soul is entirely uh, uh, important and should never have their life taken. We're made in the likeness of God. And to hate another believer is, the Bible says, is to kill that believer. We can hate so much we want to see them dead. So from the mouth come blessings and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. There's a command from James, the Lord's half-brother. But the Holy Spirit, when our mouth is in the gutter or spewing out things against other people that are so harmful in their presence or behind their back. These things ought not to be so because it hurts the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us to hear these things. 
All of our speech is supposed to be love. In uh, John 13, Jesus told his disciples a new commandment, I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And when you love one another, when you're talking uh, uh, good to one another, building up, never putting down, never gossiping, never slandering, never hating, when you're doing this, all the people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But when people, Christians, have hatred for one another and, and venom spewing out of their mouth, they don't want anything to do with Jesus' disciples. <laughs> they will think, my goodness, these people can't come from God. <laughs> so that's grieving. Grieving the Holy Spirit is a terrible thing, and our bad speech makes him very sad. After all, if we're talking about another Christian, the Holy Spirit is living inside of that Christian. Who is the Spirit of God? The Holy Spirit of God. God is a trinity, a triunity. He's three in one. He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, in the book of Matthew, where Jesus was baptized, in chapter 3, uh, we see Jesus in the water, the Son of God. He, he said, I am the Son of Man. He said, my Father's in heaven. The Son of God in the water. And then the Spirit of God visibly descending like a dove and alighting on Jesus, the second person. And then a voice from the Father. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. That's just one scripture discussing the triunity of God. When God created the heavens and the earth, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all had a purpose in creation of this planet and of people. And then in uh, four th uh, Ephesians 4.30, it's the Holy Spirit of God. He's holy. Just as God is holy, this, his spirit is holy. It's all God, the three in one. He's set apart. He's sinless. He, he has uh, utter purity, no taint of darkness or evil within him, and never the possibility of it ever happening. In John 14, 17, when a person is saved, the Holy Spirit comes with us, and he will be in us. He dwells within every believer. And because of that, we have a lot. <laughs> There's no other group of people that has ever existed from Adam and Eve on that have continually had the Holy Spirit within them all the way until forever, even when we die, we will have the Holy Spirit in us. And what does he do in us? That brings us to our uh, third and last point. What is the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God? This is one reason why he gets so sad over believers that have such bad speech towards other believers, is that he, God himself, is inside of us and provides us with so much. Now, I could have put scripture references, uh, many of them, b beside each one of these ministries that he does. And where would we be without him? He adopts us into God's family. He baptizes us into the family of God. He bears witness to Jesus inside of us. He calls us to a ministry. He convicts us of our sin. He empowers us to live the Christian life. We all have the ability to say nothing but good, nothing but will build up to every single believer we ever meet, and other people as well. He empowers us with a power that we don't have ourselves. He fills us all the way to the top, so there's no more self. There's just the Holy Spirit uh, words coming out of us. He guarantees us our future salvation and place in heaven. He guards us. He is our helper. He illuminates our hearts to understand his word. And he 
uh, lives within us. He intercedes for us in our prayers. He uh, leads us. He gives us guidance in our lives. He produces his fruit, that the love and the joy and the peace and gentleness and goodness and long-suffering, all the things that God wants us to be like, the Holy Spirit does that inside of us. He provides all of our spiritual character. When we're going through trials, he helps us to bear up under trials and mature and to grow. He regenerates us. When we're saved, we're made brand new by this new person that he creates inside of us, that the new person doesn't want to talk evil. He reminds us of God's word. He, he restrains and uh, when we're trying to sin, he can bring restraint in our life. He will convict us of trying to do sin. Uh, he's going to resurrect us if we die on this earth before the Lord comes. Uh, he reveals truth to us. He sanctifies us. He helps us to grow uh, one step at a time throughout our lives. And he seals us. He stamps us with uh, the fact that we belong to God. We are God's very own and we can never be removed from being God's very own. He selects overseers for churches. He sends out missionaries. He gives us the strength that, he need, that we need. We, he teaches us. He's our comforter. He comforts us in times of sorrow and sadness. The Holy Spirit does so much. He provides us with so much power in the new nature, the good man inside of us. And when we sin, with all this power available, it hurts him. It makes him feel very sad. And it makes him feel sad for the people that we talk about sometimes. I even, you know, when I think about this world, the Bible says to be good to your enemies. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them water. And so... Uh, as conservatives, as ones that want to follow God and ones that do not want to see babies killed and ones that don't, do not want to see kids taught to be sexually immoral and confused in who they are as human beings, we really don't like the people that do that to us. But God says vengeance is his. And during the tribulation, he will take vengeance. And it could be on the very people today that are doing this. But how does he want us to be? He wants us to love our enemies. So when we see that they have needs, we're to give them what they need. And that's totally different than the world, believe me. <laughs> and uh, First Peter talks about this. He said, if you're persecuted for being a Christian... And if you take it properly, if you don't fight back when you're imprisoned or, or being tortured, if, if you have the attitude that Christ had, that sometimes somebody might say, why are you so different? Why do you have this hope? What is this hope? You have a future. You're not afraid of death. And then you can share the gospel and people can be saved. But if we're not acting like Jesus did during the time of persecution, if we're um, condemning and threatening and, and screaming and yelling and, and swearing, whatever, that's not Christ-like. We're to have a Christian worldview of persecution and of death and martyrdom, precious in the sight of God or the saints that do die. So, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that's given here as the main reason that we're not to grieve him. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What is sealing? Sealing is... Uh, is, is one way to really look at it clearly is when they had a scroll and they didn't have books with pages that turned like ours, they were rolled up scrolls of uh, some kind of writing material and then they would put seals, wax seals on them. In Revelation, that's what Jesus opens, the seals of that scroll. He takes them off one at a time. 
on the tomb that Jesus was put in. The magistrate said to put seals on that tomb so that if anybody took that seal off, that person would be held accountable. That indicated that the government is in charge of that tomb and that stone, and don't you dare disturb it. When God seals us with the Holy Spirit, he is declaring that we belong to him. We're his people. We read about sealing uh, a few times in the book of Ephesians. Uh, chapter 1, verse 13. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, so that means that sealing begins at the time of salvation. The gospel of your salvation had believed in him. When that happened, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We are sealed all the way through our whole lives until we finally receive our inheritance. And that comes after we die, or if we go up uh, in the rapture. So it's the promised Holy Spirit. He's indicating that we belong to God now. We don't even belong to our own selves. And anybody that we talk about, or gossip about, or speak evil of, that person likewise has been sealed and belongs to God, a fellow believer. And he's just saying to us, don't speak of another believer because he belongs to God, because the Holy Spirit's inside of him too. Be patient. Let the guy, let the girl, let him live. Help them, encourage them. Don't put people down unnecessarily. How long are we sealed for? Well, we're sealed all the way until the end. All the way until our bodies are redeemed. Romans 8.32 puts it this way. We wait eagerly for the adoption of sons. That's the revealing of all the sons of God at the coming of Christ in the air for his church. The redemption of our bodies. And that's what is mentioned here. The redemption of our bodies. We're sealed all the way till redemption. That's when our bodies will finally be uh, delivered from the sinful nature that causes us so much trouble. So we're all sealed, all believers, all the way until God calls us up. We begin a Christian life as a baby and we grow and we mature. And the more we mature, the, the better our speech should be. And that's the redemption of our bodies. God is working in all of us. We're to have patience with ourselves and other people. Uh, there's so many personality types and so many characters. and uh, Some people are very annoyed with other people. Some people can't stand to be around some people. Maybe uh, somebody that's always wants everything done right now and, and doesn't want to appreciate art or, or appreciate um, or the development of things, just boom, 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 just get it done. And, and people that are very artful and want to take time and think about it and make it beautiful, this person that wants it, boom, 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 just has no time for the other person. Come on, you're boring me. I'm getting frustrated with you. And then the person that wants everything beautiful says, give me a chance, let me make everything beautiful. Or the person that's an expert in putting down carpet and feels that they're the only ones that know how it should be put down and other people bring up other ways. And the church develops and says, I want to, we want to put it down this way. And the person says, well, I'm not coming back anymore <laughs> because you crossed my will. God is working in all of us. We all have to have patience with one another. Uh, we can annoy each other, but we have to have patience. I've heard this term that says God wants us to love each other, but that doesn't mean we have to like each other. Oh, come on. <laughs> My mom 
said that she loved me, but I didn't give her much reason to when I was a teenager. Terrible reasons why not to love me. But, but she liked me. She still liked me, as, as menacing as I was to her, and, you know, messing up my life so much and making her ashamed and everything um, because of me always getting caught for some doing some stupid thing. I didn't know that steamrollers, if you turn them one way, they go the other way. So as a steamroller in the new tennis court in high school, when it was going right towards the fence, and of course I was not working there that day, I was just a dumb kid on it trying to impress my friends, and I turned the steamroller the other way, and it goes more into the fence, and it finally wrecks the fence and damages the steamroller, and they call my mom. He, what? <laughs> a steamroller? But she always liked me. She, what's this deal about we can love one another, but we don't have to like each other? I think we do have to like each other. I think we do have to love each other. We don't have to accept all of our sins and our troubles and everything in life. Of course not. But we can see each other as somebody that the Holy Spirit lives in them too, and the Holy Spirit is helping them to grow and to change. And God says, please don't put each other down with your mouth like you do. Please don't gossip. And that's such a, a problem in the church and in Christian ministry today. We have to bear with one another. And that's what it means, to bear with one another, to put up with one another. And God forgives us, so we should forgive each other. In these last couple of verses here, in, in verse 31 and 32, we'll look at next week. We can be bitter with each other. We can be wrathful with other people, Christians. We can be angry with other Christians. Clamor means to yell at other Christians. We can make up stuff about them. All those things have to be put away. Instead, we're supposed to be kind. So when somebody makes us so mad we can be angry or wrathful, we're still to be kind with one another. When people just annoy us till we can't stand it anymore, we're supposed to be tender-hearted and forgiving because God forgave us. And when we don't, the Holy Spirit is so hurt. I'd like to finish by looking at Psalm 78. Naturally, the word grieving is here, and naturally it's God that's grieved. And when the people of Israel came out of Egypt, God brought them out with such power, destroying the Egyptian army for them and bringing them food every day that just appeared and uh, bringing them birds <laughs> to eat and bringing them water coming out of rocks and not letting their clothing wear out for 40 years. But they, they, they still were not good to each other. They were not good to God. They f constantly did the wrong thing. And yet, and God was so grieved with these people. They had so much, so much potential and possibilities. And then when he finally killed off the old crowd, because he wouldn't let them go into the promised land, the new crowd that grew up those 40 years, when they got into the land, they did well for a while, but the next thing you know, they're doing the same things their, their parents did. So let's begin reading in verse 32 of Psalm 78. Uh, God being so good to them, in spite of all this, they still sinned. In spite of God's wonders, they did not believe. And, and think about this, that we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. They didn't. And we have the power of God. So when God is in us, we should perform like he wants us to. I am holy, be holy. They had all of God's wonders, but they didn't be holy. <laughs> they wouldn't be holy. So he made their days vanish like a breath, and their years in terror. When he killed them, they sought him and repented and sought God earnestly. They remembered that God was their rock and the Most High, their Redeemer. But they flattered him with their mouths, and they lied with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not faithful to his covenant. Yet, he being compassionate, he toned, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. Remember, God has a lot of emotions. 
and remember that they were but flesh. A wind that passes and, and comes not again. He was realizing the frailty of a human being and a human being with a sinful nature. They're just flesh. <laughs> they just tear a little bit and boom, they're gone. And How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Just how they grieve God in the desert. We can grieve God too when we speak evil of another brother or sister. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. And they did not remember his power or the day when he redeemed them from the foe. All, when he performed all the signs in Egypt, all the things to deliver them, and it goes into all of that. They forgot the power of God. Well, they, they didn't have to test God. They didn't have to grieve him if they were only would have trusted in his power. And that's the way with us. If we would only trust in God's power to curb our tongue. Remember the, the Bible says, who can control the tongue? The Holy Spirit can inside of us. He can control our tongue. And when we're provoked or another believer's angry or does something really bad against us, we can respond in kindness and not return evil for evil with our mouth, with our speech. As much as is possible with you, live at peace with one another, not fight with one another. And the world is very good at turning groups of people against one another. They've done it in the world, they've done it in our country, and they're doing it in the church, of turning people against people. And the church should be able to forgive by the power of the Holy Spirit within us. So we don't want to be like the people in the wilderness. We want to be like the people that Acknowledge that God does live on us and acknowledge that God is all-powerful and he can change even me. <laughs> he can change kids and have them talk well with one another. And it's so good to actually see evidence of that sometimes. <laughs> Not all the time. Remember that they're just flesh and they're kids. But uh, sometimes they really surprise you because they're learning. They're growing. And the ones that are saved, the Holy Spirit works inside of them and is changing them and empowers them. So that's so good. So this scripture is such a powerful one. And uh, besides that, there's another place in um, Isaiah talks about the people of Israel and they grieve God. And then this verse here, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't make him so sad and sorrowful that you're not using him to curb your tongue. And just say something nice. I guess I could sum it up in just two little sayings. Why can't we all just get along? Rodney King. Oh, there's so much to that. Uh, and the other one, my mother always used to say, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it. And I've wanted to say that to Christians many times. But if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. We pray, Lord, that uh, the words of this message will dwell within our hearts and that the Holy Spirit will make them very real to us, that we will learn not to slander and gossip about other believers, but to forgive each other, to bear with each other, and to build each other up, to be patient with one another. So fill us with your love and your kindness and your goodness that a uh, part of us so much wants to be like, we pray. And help us, Lord, to overcome evil with good when evil and slander are thrown our way. Lord, help us to bring everything to you, to the God who is just and righteous and always uh, repays evil for evil, but we don't. Thank you, Lord, that you give us that possibility of not sinning with our mouth. Lord, we don't want to grieve you. And help us to be conscious of this and have a tender heart towards you and towards other people. We do pray these things in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.